Good morning, Glencliff. We are so thankful to gather and worship today, even after several months. Gathering this way is not what we're used to and not necessarily what we want to get used to. And we celebrate that our commitment and faith with God means that we meet and gather wherever we are, however we need, because God meets us and gathers with us wherever we are, however we need. And we are thankful that we can still gather in at least this way. And amen. We do want to announce that this is our last Sunday having Pastor Luke with us. He is returning to his program and so his internship has ended and we just want to say a deep thanks and express great gratitude with Luke for his gifts and for his ministry with us this summer. We look forward to your next and hopefully to having you back to visit with us from time to time. In birthdays, we would like to celebrate Miss Paulette who had her birthday yesterday and Miss Mary, oh, I'm sorry, who had her birthday on August 6th, which was Thursday, and Miss Mary, who had her birthday yesterday on August 8th. Happy birthday to you both. We are thankful for your being, your presence, your spirits, your wisdom, and your energy with our community and in this world. You are such a gift, and we are thankful to know you. Happy birthday. Now, if you will join us in our call to worship, and if you have a candle and a lighter or uh, matches handy, you can light your candle with us. Loving God, here in this place, you welcome all the dreamers as well as all the doubters. Here, the warriors and the wanderers can call you by name. Here in this time, we can remember all the ways that you grace us. Here in these moments, we are reminded that you are with us always. Here we are gathered, daring enough to step out of comfort into the unknown and the uncomfortable. Here in this faith space, we will find the courage to cry out, God save us, and to receive your saving grace in every situation. Amen. Good morning, Glencliff. My name is Ingrid. I'm one of the pastors at Glencliff United Methodist Church. And we've come to a time now to share in prayers, um, prayers of thanksgiving, um, prayers of grief, prayers of frustration, all the prayers that we have right now. Um, if you are like me, your prayer life has been robust during um, this COVID pandemic, because I'm just not sure. Um, how to navigate every day. And so I've been trying to keep my connection with God strong. We want to lift up um, some particular joys and concerns that I'll share with you here in just a minute. But we also want you to know that if you have additional um, joys or concerns or frustrations or um, celebrations that you want to share with us, that we would love for you to connect with us. Um, whether you're a member or whether you're not, we don't care. We um, are thankful and give thanks and love 
the community of siblings that we are here together in this earth, um, connected through God and the spirit. So if you would like to share any of those concerns and joys, please feel free um, to email us at glencliffum at gmail.com or to call us at 615-833-5050. Um, and if you're listening on Facebook, please feel free to add um, those requests just right in the dialogue box below. Okay? We care about you. We care about what's going on in your life right now, um, in the lives of the people in your community. Um, we know this is a particularly tricky time, um, and we want to share um, in the things that are important to you. Let us pray. Oh God, in this strange time that we are living with, send Holy Spirit to be with each of us scattered around the city, scattered around the state, scattered around the world. God, we know and love people all around this world, and we ask that you be present with each one of them in the way that they need right now. Be our strength and our guide. For all those beginning a new school year, that they will remain safe and healthy as they study, and that teachers and parents are given the stamina and the strength and the tools that they need to make a difference in young children's lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For victims of crimes and those who perpetrate them, for those who are oppressed by racism, sexism, homophobia, or anything that lessens their value given to them by God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all of our friends and family living in nursing and rehabilitation homes, including Sanford and Buddy, including George and Connie and Jackie, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those experiencing or recovering from health issues, including Dennis and Judy and Joanne and Joel and Charlie, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all of those struggling with addictions of any kind, for people who struggle with trauma or troubling situations, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those of us who are experiencing loneliness and isolation, especially those who can't leave their homes during the COVID quarantine time, all of those around the world, God, be present with each one. We give you thanks for the ways that you are present with us through each other. We give you thanks for the presence of Holy Spirit. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Guide me, O Thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Now the 
crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. This morning's scripture lesson comes from Genesis chapter 37, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 4, and then 12 through 28. This is how it reads. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, in the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilah and Zilpah and his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to, the past, to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I'll send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? The man said, They've gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him there from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes the dreamer. Come, now let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into the pit here in, in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he, might be res that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to their father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him out of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him in the pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming, to Gilead, coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello everyone, my name is Hubert Cunningham and I once had the distinct privilege and opportunity to serve as the pastor of Glencliff United Methodist Church. You know, it just seems like it was a few days ago that I was uh, the pastor at Glencliff. However, as I look at the calendar, I realize that it was exactly 30 years ago that I came to be the pastor of that church. And so... Uh, I've, I've aged a little bit, and some of you have too, but what a distinct honor it is to be the 
uh, speaker for today. I uh, appreciate the invitation so very much. Rudyard Kipling was a beloved British author. He was a poet. He was a journalist. But he married a girl from Vermont. Her name was Carolyn Ballister. And they built a beautiful home in Battlesboro, Vermont, and they planned on living there for the remainder of their life. While uh, Rudyard Kipling was in Vermont, he met his brother-in-law, Beatty Ballister, and uh, they had a great relationship. They became the closest friends that people could have. They did everything together. They were inseparable. And one day, Rudyard asked uh, Beatty if he would sell him a plot of land. And Beatty agreed to do so, but said, I would like to harvest the hay from that field for the remainder of the years. And of course, uh, Rudyard said, well, that would be wonderful. You may do that. And so he bought the land with that understanding. And then one day, uh, Beatty caught his brother-in-law, Rudyard, out there uh, laying out a flower garden. And he blew his top. Apparently, Kipling did as well because one observer said that the air over the green mountains of Vermont turned blue. I'm sure they said some things that they wished they had not said that were regrettable. Uh, maybe it was uh, some hurtful things that took place in that conversation, but nevertheless, it was a done deal. Not many days after that, uh, Kipling was riding his bicycle and uh, his brother-in-law, Beatty, came along with a wagon and a team of horses and ran so close to him that it knocked uh, Kipling off of his bike. Well, Kipling became so angry that uh, he was inspired to write a poem and that poem became the Best love poem, it was actually just recently voted, the best love poem in Great Britain. It said, if you keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. But uh, Kipling did not stop with just writing a poem. He actually uh, charged or had his brother-in-law charged with assault. It went into court and it was uh, not fully resolved in the courts. As a result, uh, Rudyard Kipling and his wife Carolyn uh, abandoned their home in Vermont and left, all because of a dispute over a hayfield. Well, family disputes are something that happens quite frequently. You may even have a story about a family dispute that happened in your family over some perhaps insignificant issue. But as we look at our scripture today in Genesis chapter 37, we discover a biblical family that had a major uh, family dispute. It seems that it was a struggle over Joseph, who was Jacob's favorite son. He had uh, made that perfectly clear by giving him a coat of many colors and all the fa favoritism that he was shown. Joseph didn't help the matter either because uh, he uh, told his brothers that he had a dream in which he uh, envisioned that he was in control or in power and they were all bowing down before him. And so therefore, there was a great deal of animosity between his brothers and Joseph. So one day, uh, Jacob said to his son Joseph, go out and make shalom, make peace with your brothers. And so as they saw him coming before he arrived, they uh, came up with a scheme, a plot, a plan that would uh, cause Joseph to be killed. They hated him that much. But one of the brothers named Reuben said, let's don't kill him. Instead, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. 
Now, the Ishmaelites were the uh, half-brothers of uh, Isaac. And we'll sell him to the Ishmaelites, and we'll be rid of him, but yet we won't have to do him any harm. And we'll tell his father, our father, that uh, he was destroyed by some wild animal. So they agreed to do that. Uh, then it seems as though uh, Joseph was stolen from the Ishmaelites to the, by the Midianites, which was the in-laws of Moses. So now you have a scheme that involved the Israelites, the Ishmaelites, and the Midianites. Uh, evil has no boundaries. Uh, it is universal. And so there we have Joseph exiting the scene because of a family squabble. Well, as we see that one story, we begin to understand that God has a plan in all of this. And it's difficult to see God working in all of this, but God is actually working in all of this. Joseph is one of those places that we can look in the past and we can see how God has been working and we can stand and look into the future and see how God will work in the future. This whole mess began with a promise that God made to Abram and Sarah, that Abram's seed would be multiplied greatly and he would be the father of a great nation. When he told his wife Sarah what God had told him, she laughed because she said, this is not possible, we are old. She had not discovered that God, all things are possible with God. So she became uh, concerned about fulfilling that promise and helping God a little bit. We should never help God with his uh, promises if it's different from what he has told us to do. But she did. So she said to Abram one day, look, it's never going to happen between me and you. We're not going to have a child but there is this young slave girl named Hagar. Perhaps the promise could come about through Hagar. So Abram was a willing participant, and him and Hagar had a child named Ishmael. Well, God's plan was that Abram and Sarah would have a child. And certainly that's what happened. Later we discover that Abram and Sarah had a child, and his name was Isaac. Well, in this part of the, the scripture, we discover that the promise belongs to the firstborn. So therefore, it would belong to Ishmael, right? Well, actually, it was given to Isaac because he was the one that Sarah had uh, given birth to. And it was the promise made to Abram and Sarah. Well, Isaac was, was uh, married later to Rebekah, and they have two sons. They have twins, actually, Esau and Jacob. We've been looking at that in the scripture, and we discover that Esau was born first, and Jacob was born second. However, we discover that Esau should be the one who receives the birthright. But Rebekah um, makes uh, some deceptive moves and convinces uh, Isaac that Jacob is the one to receive the birthright. And once the birthright has been given, it cannot be taken back. So Jacob gets the birthright. He enters into a journey because he is afraid that his brother now is going to be upset with him. And so he goes to another place and he falls in love with a woman by the name of Rachel. He asks her father if he could marry her. And his father says, well, we have a, a tradition in our family you work seven years, and then you can marry our daughter. So he worked seven years, and he said, well, we have another tradition in our family, and that is that the oldest daughter has to be married first. So he married uh, her sister Leah, worked another seven years before he was able to marry Rachel, whom he really loved. And Jacob and Rachel were the parents of Joseph. Wow, that's quite a story of deception that's kind of, uh, quite a story of, of human sinfulness and how humanity wants to 
change and manipulate God's plan, but in the future we discover that that is impossible. As we look down the road into the future, we discover that Joseph was sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites and stolen by the Midianites, but he ended up in Egypt. And while he was in Egypt, he uh, uh, found favor with Pharaoh, and he found himself second in command with Pharaoh. Only Pharaoh had more authority and power in Egypt than Joseph did. And at the same time, there was brewing a famine. And the famine was foreseen by Joseph, and Egypt had prepared for it. They had stored the grain. Israel had not. And so when the people became hungry, uh, we discover that Joseph, or, or Jacob, sent uh, his sons over to Egypt to see if they could get some grain. And they had to go and bow down before Joseph, not knowing who it was. And as a result of, of this migrating over to Egypt to get grain, we discover the, the uh, Israelites ended up in Egypt. Well, Pharaoh uh, changed and a new Pharaoh came into power that did not find favor with Joseph. As a result, the Hebrews uh, ended up in bondage as slaves, and uh, it was uh, a difficult and dark time for the uh, Israelites. But God had a plan, and that plan would be that he would raise up Moses, and Moses would uh, go to uh, Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And he was able, through a series of plagues, to convince Pharaoh to let them go, and they went led by Moses over into the wilderness, eventually would be led into the promised land by Joshua, where they would discover the promise of a land of milk and honey. In all of this, we see that God has a plan. And it's sometimes difficult for us to discern what that plan is. We, we try to, to work our human knowledge and understanding and logic into that plan but but God has a plan that he is going to accomplish sometimes because of us sometimes with us and sometimes in spite of us and so as a result we discover that his plan unfolds just as he wants I think about uh, the fact that God has a plan for us and that plan involves for us to be in the center of His will. And in the center of His will, we, we find our gifts and abilities and talents that will contribute most to the kingdom of God. And if we submit to God's will and plan, then we're able to contribute much to the kingdom of God. But the real sticking point is being submissive to God's will because sometimes we are not in favor of God's will we are more in favor of our will I think about uh, the plan that God has not only for individuals but the plan he has for churches and I think about the plan that God has had for Glencliff United Methodist Church you know back in the early 50s when there was a group of people that left Woodbine United Methodist Church to come over into the Glencliff community to start a new congregation. They had a vision, there was a plan, and God used the faithfulness of those people. I think about people like Grace and Willard Bonet. I think about uh, people like Lud Rogers and Christine Pointer. I think about people like Joe and Ruby Davis and Bud Sharpton and Nelda Baggett. I could go on and on and on of the faithful people back in those early days that said we're going to, to do what God is leading us to do. And they not only did it, they uh, made sacrifices to do it. And along the way, God sent pastors who had gifts and abilities and talents that would participate in that plan. When I was the pastor there, I remember listening to stories about uh, people like Gene Barrett. Everybody loved Gene Barrett, and they would talk about 
his uh, uh, laugh that was unquestionably something that made you feel at ease and joy. In fact, there's a little story about the fact that the church had voted to have blue carpet installed in the church, but Gene wanted red carpet. And so when uh, they came to church the next Sunday, they discovered that red carpet had been installed and not the blue carpet as they had voted. But Gene just gave them that laugh and everybody was happy with the red carpet. I think about some celebrated pastors that's been there through the years. I think about uh, people like Terry Little, uh, who uh, for many years was the church uh, conference treasurer and statistician, but he was also a gifted preacher. I think about people uh, like Lloyd Mabry that was there. I followed a guy by the name of Hawkins Clark, and Hawkins Clark was a short fella, but he was a giant of faith. What a terrific fella he was. And even I had the opportunity to participate in the Glencliff plan. Well, that was the plan that the church envisioned. That's what they had hoped that God would accomplish. And because of their faithfulness, there are many people that have found their way into heaven and found their way into Christian service because of the faithfulness of Glencliff United Methodist Church. God's plan, though, is not always complete in what we envision. Our vision sometimes is limited. It has boundaries. Back when Glencliff began in the early 50s, the world was a different place. The Glencliff community was a different community. I was thinking about how people would find employment at, at AFCO or maybe at Radnor Yards or one of the other uh, businesses or factories around there. And Glencliff was filled with middle class working people that were truly the salt of the earth. But now the community has changed and the need to offer the gospel has remained the same, but we now need to offer that gospel to a different group of people. That group of people that was once there have diminished, but another group of people has come in. I am so grateful, I am so proud of the vision and the passion and the compassion that people like Ingrid McIntyre uh, has to minister to the least of these in our society. As I look at the, the campus there at Glencliff, I am, I am honored to be a Christian and to be a United Methodist as I see the commitment in the tiny houses there at the villages of Glencliff. Well, Rebecca wanted the blessing for uh, Jacob rather than Esau. Uh, others wanted things along the way that would be different, but God had a plan, and His plan prevailed over the, all the others. The last thing I want to leave with you is that God's plan continues with the same purpose, but adapting to changing conditions. And I appreciate the fact that, that God has His hand upon Glencliff, that He will deliver that uh, congregation, your, your faithfulness, into a way that will be a beacon of light and love and hope into that community. As you know, here at Glencliff United Methodist Church, we are still in active ministry in our community and with each other. And because of that, it is still really important that we consider our offerings and our tithes every week. Let us enter a time of offering, not because we owe God, but because we understand as a part of our faith that our blessing is a gift also that we must share with one another. You can give online, you can give on Facebook, either on our page or we've created a fundraiser for today. Um, also on the next screen, we will have um, our church address. If you would rather pop a check in the mail to help support our ministries right now, um, particularly our outreach ministries. 
it's all very helpful and we're very, very thankful. We are doing our best to continue in this time, particularly with some of our most vulnerable neighbors. So as we consider these offerings, let us go to God in prayer. Pray with me. Merciful God, whose blessings we all are gifted with and receive, accept this offering from your people. We thank you for remembering us in your love. When we give and when we receive both, we bless this offering to further your kingdom and bringing forth greater healing, greater justice, greater peace and wholeness in your world. In the name of life, in the name of spirit, in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I was telling somebody the other day that uh, I'm not always pleased with the decisions that the United Methodist Church makes, though I'm a lover of the United Methodist Church. I appreciate its ministry and witness, and I have invested my life in the church, but sometimes I disagree with them. But when I look at what is happening at Glencliff, I'm proud to be a United Methodist. I'm proud to be a Christian. Because I know that there are those that are faithful to God's will and way, to His leadership, and I believe this hand is upon them. And because of that, I believe that the best days are ahead for Glencliff United Methodist Church. That the glory days have not arrived and, and in the past, but the glory days are truly in the future because God is in it. May God bless you as you continue your faithful service into the community and into the city, into the state, and into the world. Amen. Oh, yeah.